Hi, seventh graders. Welcome to Monday. Welcome back to Life Science. Okay, here's my screen. Today is the recording for Monday, April 6th. You're gonna, as usual, watch your video and take great notes. So write down what I'm asking you to write. I'll see you later at the daily uh, Q&A Zoom and I'll have questions from this video for you. And please head over to your own web so that you can check your Google Classroom uh, to see if there's homework there for you. Um, there should be an assignment on 4-7, I mean, that's on 4-6 for you that'll be due tomorrow. Okay, let's get going. Quick review. We finally got to talk about phylum chordata last Friday. And remember, phylum chordata is cool. It is the only phylum that contains vertebrates. So now it's time to talk about all the animals that we're more familiar with. But remember that weird thing about phylum chordata is that yes, it contains vertebrates, but it also contains invertebrates. So isn't that weird? Well, why would those two types of creatures be in one phylum? Well, they have four characteristics that are in common. So let's review those quickly. Notochord that may develop into part of the vertebral column. A nerve cord that develops into the spinal cord and brain. The pharyngeal pouches that develop into gills for aquatic creatures and that develop into parts of the inner ear or the jaw um, or even part of the tonsils if it is a terrestrial creature. And also, a tail can be present at some point in their development. Okay, so that's what we've looked at. And we started looking specifically at the vertebrates in this phylum, um, grouped in, in five, right? We covered fish already and we covered reptiles. Today, I'm gonna try and shoot for amphibians, birds, and mammals. Let's go. Here, amphibians, take a look at that. Let me grab my notes. All right, so here's just an assortment of amphibians. I have them grouped in their three major types. You see newts and salamanders on one side, and you see frogs and toads on the other side. And in the middle, Sicilians, those are called. All right, so about amphibians, you know, we learned about fish, and fish live in water, right? And we learned about reptiles that are land dwellers. They live on land. Well, here are the guys that get to do both at some time in their lives amphibians. Um, amphibians are incredible. These guys start out in the water. So they really start out with lungs, but then I mean with gills, and they can um, take in oxygen from the water, but then they develop, they may develop lungs, and then they become air breathers and can head off to the land. Wow, that's what's incredible about amphibians. A lot of them can do that. So the amphibians can go through metamorphosis. Something that's pretty incredible, something else is that um, notice that they look wet, don't they? They all look wet and moist. That's important for amphibians. Even when they're grown and they have their lungs, lungs are not the only way these creatures breathe. They can still head back to the water. Their skin has to stay moist so that they can breathe essentially through their skin. Their skin is so thin that the capillaries and the vessels are very near the surface and that moisture is part of helping them draw oxygen out of the air and directly in through the skin so that it can be absor absorbed into their, into their blood and be circulated through their system and then the carbon dioxide can be excreted right out of their skin again. Isn't that amazing? Those are amphibians. All right, something else about amphibians. They're cold-blooded. And they have three chambered hearts. That's okay for amphibians, right? Um, their metabolism is not gonna be as high if they're cold-blooded and a three-chambered heart, albeit not terrifically efficient, is enough. Um, they really will use their lung capacity for the times when they're the most active. Then they can um, use those larger lungs, but oftentimes they just breathe via their skin. Something else about amphibians, oh, they lay eggs but without protective hard coverings. They'll lay eggs in moist environments, so they'll lay eggs in the water. Let's see. All right, let's go on. Let's put all that in our notes. I'm gonna to switch to our notes slide. There you go. So pause this video and take these notes, all right? And we'll start again. 
right, the next creatures we want to talk about, birds. Birds are vertebrates. Birds have that, um, uh, their, I'm sorry, their skin is covered with feathers, stiff feathers that enable them to move through the air. Amazing vertebrates, right? Um, birds can also spend time in the water, some of them, and the ones that spend the time in the water, really, penguins, for instance, they actually have oil glands that will help to waterproof their feathers, and that helps them slip quickly through the water, and it also helps to keep them dry. Something else about birds, you notice they have beaks. They don't chew. Um, what's unique about birds, they have gizzards. A gizzard is part of their digestive system that makes up for the fact that they cannot chew their food. Uh, for a gizzard, uh, that organ, they will um, take in small pebbles or perhaps sand, granules of sand, so that it can crush up the food that they have swallowed. Um, it's just part of their digestive system. All right, something else is that they are warm-blooded. This group of mammals is warm-blooded, so they have four chambered hearts. Wow, warm-blooded creatures have high metabolisms. They certainly can move around a lot. They're going to need a lot of cellular respiration, right? They're going to need a lot of oxygen supplied and a lot of carbon dioxide expelled from their systems. So this four-chambered heart is part of their circulation system that can pump really efficiently and well and get that job done. All right, something else about birds is that they lay fluid-filled eggs with hard shells. All right, let's go on. I want, I'm really eager to share this with you. The ostrich. I know it's not a fancy bird, but it reminds me always the ostrich because, you know, they get, they get teased. They're not very bright. They're just known as the um, simpler of the birds. But, uh, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible that just shows that God's planning is amazing. He planned for all the creatures on the earth, right? That's our theme verse, is how wise he is, and in wisdom he made them all. So I want to share with you one of my favorite passages that reminds me that, uh, you know, even the simple ostrich is made simply, and yet God equipped this ostrich purposefully very, very well. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about ostriches. What this verse says about them, that's ah, pretty true. Um, an ostrich doesn't build a nest per se. An ostrich simply has what's called a scratch nest. And a scratch nest is just a simple, even just a scratch in the ground. An ostrich will lay their very large eggs just out in the open, um, uh, not very protected at all. And if the ostrich is living in a community of ostriches, then the mom ostrich may not get to watch her own young. Another mommy ostrich would be probably in charge of their pile of eggs. And guess what would happen to that mom's egg? It might be sacrificed as a distraction to a predator so that the other mom can protect her own eggs. So this first rings very true. Um, so let's learn a little bit from the scripture about ostriches, okay? I'm going to read to you from Job 39, 18. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but they cannot compare with the pinions and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain. For God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet, when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. This verse really highlights that, yes, the, the ostrich has the teeniest brain and is very simple, but so very well equipped to defend itself and to run. It can run faster than a horse with a rider on it. Um, all right, so I have a link there to a video. I would really like you to pause the video, uh, pause this video and go and watch that video. The link I put already in your RenWeb, um, or you can just copy and paste it into another window or write it down and paste it. I'll see you after the video. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. We're gonna continue talking about mammals. Oh, no, actually, this is our first slide about mammals. <gasps> we made it. We did it, amphibians and birds. On to mammals now, terrific. Let's do this. All right, I have a nice selection of mammals for you to look at. 
Um, we can divide mammals into three main groups, really. Marsupials on the left, monotremes in the middle, placental mammals on the right. All right, I'm gonna jump in and start talking about the monotremes first. Right in the middle there, monotremes. Very different creatures. Okay, the spiny anteater and the platypus are classified as mammals. They lay eggs. It's amazing. But remember, we do have some uh, crossover animals. Animals are very hard to classify. The amazing organization, I mean, the variety of creatures that God put in the world are very hard for us to divide and see clear lines between them. Well, here we have the spiny anteater and the platypus in with the mammals. They lay eggs. Now, how about the marsupials? Let's talk about those guys. Marsupials actually give birth to babies that are not yet fully developed. And what that baby has to do is crawl into a pouch on the mother's abdomen, um, find a nipple, and then there, protected within the pouch, the baby can continue to uh, uh, develop while it's suckling. All right, and on the other side, placental mammals. This is an interesting group. You know, scientists that say humans are animals too, well, they would group us here as placental mammals. Let's figure out what these guys are. Placental mammals um, give birth to babies that are completely developed within the mother's womb before they are born. All right. Um, at some point in their lives, all these different groups of creatures, at some point in their lives, they have hair. Um, and most of them tear and chew their food. Oh, I'm going through the characteristics of mammals now. So they'll have hair at some time in their lives or fur. Um, they will, most of them chew their food. They tear their food and chew it with teeth. Um, what else? They have complete digestive systems, right? We know that. And complete nervous systems. They are higher animals. So their nervous system also contains the, uh, the, a, a brain. And they have mammary glands. Those are, uh, they produce milk for their young, right? A gland is actually an organ um, that makes a, that releases a substance. And in this case, the mammary gland releases milk for their young. All right, let's see if we can get this into our notes now. Mammals, here they are. So take those notes. Um, Make sure you write those, those things down in your science book. I'm gonna to flip to, I'll give you a second and then flip, I'll flip backwards to some examples and you can write those down. Did I cover those? Oh, I didn't mention they have four chambered hearts and they are warm blooded. We, we know that, right? They have high metabolisms. They're gonna to need to move around a lot. They need those four chambered hearts. Um, being warm blooded just lets them have that mobility. All right, I'm gonna go back. There are some of your examples, I'm sure you can think of a bajillion more. You know, chances are if you were asked to name an animal, you would name a mammal. And there are your notes. Let's see how we did. You did it, we're at the end of the Monday video. Nice job. All right, I'll see you in the Q&A later. Make sure you bring your notes because I'm gonna have questions for you. God bless y'all, bye-bye.